The following is an interview which I recorded with John Cooper QC after he spoke at the 2021 Bon Solon Expert Witnesses Conference. John has extensive experience of dealing with experts, both uh, in court and at inquiries. In the course of the interview, he deals with issues such as the crucial qualities that uh, he would like to see in an expert witness, cross-examination on the expert's methodology, and um, maintaining and retaining uh, records by experts. I found it very informative, and I hope that you do too. We've just had a very interesting session as part of the criminal breakout, although I think um, actually we didn't simply cover uh, experts in criminal cases. We looked at inquests and inquiries. So perhaps let's start there. Um, perhaps you could just explain uh, in outline the difference between uh, appearing in a criminal case uh, as an expert and appearing uh, at an inquest or at an inquiry. I think one of the most important facets to get clear right from the start on your question is that uh, a trial is an adversarial process and an inquest or a public inquiry is an inquisitorial process. So effectively with a criminal trial you're having uh, the, the expert uh, uh, propagating their opinions to a jury fundamentally if you're in court or to a magistrate but more fundamentally a jury and taking a side to a degree because that side has been chosen after uh, the, the opinion is in. In a public inquiry and an inquest you're providing evidence to you know, public inquiry of the chair or in an inquest to the coroner. It is their inquiry and so in that respect when the expert is giving evidence to an inquiry or to an inquest, nine times out of ten their evidence isn't challenged by another party. When the expert gives evidence in a criminal trial, uh, it follows uh, virtually exclusively every time uh, that they're being challenged. So that's the difference. Challenge in a criminal case, inquiry in an inquest and a coroner's, a coroner's court and a public inquiry. And um, just because it, it, it was a particularly interesting process, you, you explained about the way in which an expert witness uh, would work in an inquiry. Perhaps you could just um, de deal with that briefly. Yeah, I mean, the way an expert witness works within a public inquiry is that they, it's a collaborative approach, and that's the key word, collaboration. Uh, they will speak uh, to their colleagues. Often, for instance, as we're doing in the Manchester Arena inquiry at the moment, there's a bank of about three, maybe four experts, all opining upon the same issue. Those experts will meet and discuss matters uh, beforehand, uh, prepare their report, present their report, and then in the hearing they will sit effectively in a row and they will be asked questions during the course of the inquiry, uh, one by one, individually, going backwards and forwards to different experts, a sort of tag team approach which is different perhaps to what you'd see in a trial where the single expert would stand up in the witness box, give their evidence and then be cross-examined. And just on that point, you, you talked about the way that uh, experts give evidence at inquiries uh, together, perhaps just a little bit on that. Yes, uh, again the expert is there to assist the inquiry, to assist the chair of the inquiry, just as an expert's there to assist the coroner. Uh, they will have been instructed as a unit so three experts in the same area of expertise. They will uh, prepare their report. Uh, they will maybe thrash out differences behind closed doors and present a report which is effectively a unified opinion on an issue. Then they will present their evidence uh, to the hearing. They will be asked questions by counsel to the inquiry. And then sometimes, and I think in the best inquiries, and Manchester, I think is a blueprint for proper process in my opinion, uh, the core participants such as us uh, who are representing the bereaved families for instance, but other core participants as well are given an opportunity to, to ask the, the expert questions. Again it breaks down between that dividing line between the adversarial process in crime and the inquisitorial process in inquiries and inquests. And that when, if you have three experts in, 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 in an inquiry, they will give evidence at the same time, they will all be asked uh, questions uh, and will give evidence simultaneously. Yes, well it, within the report you'll, you'll, you'll sometimes see a particular expert deal with a particular part of the report. And so counsel will know which part of the report to address that expert to. And so for instance, you, you would say, I'm going to ask 
uh, Mrs. Smith on this issue, and then I'm going to ask Mr. Brown on that issue, and then when they finish, you'll turn back to Mrs. Smith. Is there anything you wish to add to what Mr. Brown has just said? And vice versa. So it's that sort of approach. It's not so much every, or every third, every three of the experts say the same things. It's often broken down into subject areas. Um, uh, and so it's like a tag team, as I said before, really. You're passing it from one to another. Yes. You were asked about uh, challenging uh, experts' methodology. You, you, you said that this was absolutely key in your consideration of an expert's report in preparing your uh, cross-examination. You always look at the methodology. Perhaps you could just say a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, uh, when I walk to a room, I'm looked at the, the Prince of Darkness, you know. I'm, 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 I'm the guy that cross-examines them. And I was watching them in the, in, in the session today. And if you remember, I did tell them I'm not giving all the tricks of the trade. Right now. <laughs> but one of the tricks of the trade, if one can use such a trite expression, is methodology. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's a useful way of attacking an expert's opinion because you look at what they say and then you look at how they got there. Because the journey sometimes doesn't support uh, the destination. Uh, so if you can undermine the way they've gone about their work, what they might have missed out, what it is they haven't done, then the moment you've undermined that structure Everything else they say really doesn't matter because you, you've destroyed their conclusions by undermining their foundations rather than going straight to their conclusions. Uh, once their foundations are undermined, it doesn't matter what they say because no one's listening. Yeah. I um, sound terribly nasty, don't I? <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm well, John, if you remember, no. we, we had someone who, who came in online and complimented uh, you on, on, on the, your cross-examination uh, of them. Of them, I th yes, <laughs> I, yes, indeed. He's, he's still getting over it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it sounded that <laughs> way, didn't it? Um, you, you, you mentioned recording and, and, and retaining records um, uh, and how important that was. Perhaps I could just start by asking you to just say a little bit about that in terms of the duty of the of the expert to a criminal trial? I think this is very important. It, it, uh, uh, recording, keeping records, uh, having effectively a, a, a line, a thread of the work you do which you can follow through for continuity. Disclosure is a big issue in the criminal courts particularly and, and those watching us in our discussion now will remember on a number of occasions disclosure not being fulfilled by the prosecution Indeed. and cases collapsing. Yes. Uh, I, I, that lack of disclosure is often as a result of the CPS or the police, uh, but the time will come where it's going to be as a result of an expert. And, and, and experts have to record all that they do, the meetings they have, the documents they receive, in my view the emails they receive, the electronic communications they receive, so that there is a consistent continuity thread of the work they do, so that then uh, during the course of the process of a criminal trial that can be disclosed to the other side to enhance the methodology that the expert is employing. Now, if, for instance, it, 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 all roads lead to Rome, really. If, 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 for instance, you can undermine the disclosure, you can undermine the records, guess what you're doing? You're undermining methodology. Yes. And if you're undermining methodology, you're, you're turning your expert into a person of straw. Yes, yes. Which, of course, I'd never liked it. Of course not. <laughs> um, you were also asked, and I thought this was a very practical question, uh, and, and a question that would occur to any expert, that they've retained the records uh, in relation to a case uh, where they've given evidence, trial has finished. How long after that uh, should they keep those records, or what should they do to ensure that they're keeping them for as long as they should? It's difficult to put an exact time on it. As I said to uh, the person that asked that question, sometimes a criminal trial can uh, return to haunt you, a d decade, for instance, yes. uh, a, a fresh evidence, for instance, can be introduced and that fresh evidence is usually, or often, a new expert that comes to a different point of view, which the, the team then say, well, this challenges the original expert. Yes. And, that, and as I rather exaggerated in our, in our session, I said the expert giving fresh evidence might not have been born when you actually first <laughs> gave, your, g g gave your opinion. So, in my view, keep it as long as you possibly can. It's good professional practice. 
Uh, ultimately, you should be asking your instructors, your team, how long they want you to keep it for. The CPS, for instance, if you're prosecuting, will have some guidelines. And I know you reminded me, didn't you, that for solicitors, it's six years, isn't it? For six, uh, six years for solicitors to retain their records. That, yeah. That's linked to the... Um, limitation on suing for negligence. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, it, it's a different. Nonetheless, the the time scales I think are instructive to a degree. Yes. I mean, what we're really saying here is, from my perspective, it, it is required. I go so far as that, in my opinion, it is required of an expert to keep their materials. Quite how long for? They need to thrash that out with their their instructors. Uh, and that, that's the key point, isn't it? Speak to the lawyers clear that up with them. They'll know if a case possibly is going to go to appeal, but, but clear it with them. So well, they may not know if it's going to appeal. True um, the fact yeah. of the matter is, a case which looks rock solid, how, how many times have I done a case which looks rock solid, and then uh, a few, few years later we're, we're appealing it, and yeah. successfully appealing it, because of something that came out of the woodwork later. So it's not so much the solicitor will know that there's not going to be an appeal, the solicitor will have their protocols, but also it protects the expert. Because if the expert then ultimately destroys their materials after a period of time, at least they can say, this is what the solicitor told me to do. Yes. It's not, it's not book passing, it isn't. It's nonetheless making sure that you've got your own processes which you're, which you're following. Yes. One, fi one final point, because I thought this was, um, again, a very practical question. Mm. It was to do with experts getting feedback from uh, um, the legal team in relation to whose case they've given evidence. One of the real, real bugbears as far as lawyers are concerned is the expression, uh, an expert is good on paper. Yes. That's not a compliment. <laughs> that's, yeah. not, that's not a compliment from a lawyer. That effectively is implying that they're absolutely rubbish in court. Yes. And, 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 and what you don't want as a lawyer is to see an expert give a splendid opinion that supports your case on paper. And then suddenly uh, they're a gibbering wreck in front of the jury. Uh, and so an expert needs to be consistent in what they're saying and have ability to communicate, to communicate to the tribunal, to communicate to their instructors. Those are the things we require of experts and uh, don't always get. Yes. Well, look, uh, uh, John, John Cooper QC, thank you so much for answering those questions and indeed for an absolutely fascinating session this afternoon at the Bonsall on Expert Witnesses Conference. It's my pleasure and thank you for the invitation.